Hello and welcome back to I Got The Runs. My name is Herbie Sacklaskis and I'm the creator of this YouTube channel. I wanted to create this because I absolutely love to run, but more importantly, I love our running community. I'm the president of the Cape Breton Roadrunners and I've been a part of the Cape Breton Roadrunners now for over 10 years, uh, I believe since 2010. And I wanted to introduce the uh, running community to our community here in Cape Breton. So that's why I started this channel. Please comment on who you would love to see on my show and I'll try my best to get them on. My next guest needs no introduction. He's somewhat of a local celebrity here in Cape Breton. You might know him from his day job as a news reporter for CTV Atlantic News and he's a pretty good runner. So please welcome Ryan McDonald. Thanks for having me buddy. Ryan, thanks for coming to the show man. So we're gonna start off right away. How did Ryan McDonald get the runs? Uh, for, yeah, nice, nice topic for the show. How did I start running? I'll, I'll, I'll start off by saying that I'm not a natural athlete. Now, some of the people newer to the running community might be surprised by that because uh, I, I, I'm in the you know upper mid pack of runners around here, and I have a reasonably athletic build. But I'm, I'm not naturally athletic. I was that proverbial last kid picked in gym class, and the McDonald family, genetic wise, is not an athletic <laughs> family. We are musicians. We are car dealers. We are not sportive. So <laughs> I had those things going against me. So basically I sucked at all sports growing up, but I was obsessed with hockey and I wanted to become a hockey player so bad that I would do anything. So I wanted like anything to make the high school hockey team at Riverview. Part of the high school hockey tryouts, which I thought nothing of, was dry land training. So we're, we're out there running laps and all of the super jocks, you know, the guys who sit at the jock table, mm -hmm. the guys who are guaranteed a spot on the hockey team, those guys are huffing and puffing and complaining about how much they're hating this. And I'm thinking, oddly enough, I'm kind of enjoying myself. I don't know what these guys are talking about. I'm kind of enjoying this. A few laps later, I'm like, I'm lapping some of these super jocks. Like, you know, <laughs> these are the guys who kill me at every other sport. Like, yeah, yeah. I can't hit a baseball. I can't sink a basketball. Not if you put a gun to my head. I played golf once in my life, 18 holes, I shot 181. Now, I'm that, I'm that, I'm that uncoordinated. So, so like all these, you know, I, I don't use the term jocks derogatory. They're good, yeah, yeah. they're good fellas, but like mm -hmm. all these guys who destroy me at all the other sports, I'm like, why am I lapping them on the track? Did I finally find a sport I'm good at? So that's when I realized maybe I've got a thing for running and I, I did high school cross country after that. All right. So yeah. you found it pretty early then. That's, I didn't start running until I was 27 when I started running. I was 30 when I started going to the races. So if you're in high school running track, that's fairly early in my book. In grade 11, I ran a 554 mile in a, oh, wow. in a, in a timed, you know, mile. It, it was for gym class and yeah. it was worth five points in your final mark. And you needed a sub six minute mile oh, to, wow. to get the five out of five. And I wanted it because I was, a, I was also a nerdy bookworm. I, yeah, wa yeah. I wanted a hundred in gym class. Oh, so wow. I was like, to get that hundred, I can't, I can't have a 601. It's gotta be, su it's gotta be sub six. That's a pretty good time. Uh, it, it, it was a pretty good time for a guy who was eating, you know, Dairy Queen and Donald's, I mean, when you're 17. Sounds like high school. It sounds like high school. Yeah. yeah so, so anyway, I, I did high school cross country for that one year, but despite how well I did, you know, in gym class and in hockey tryouts at the track, in the cross country meets, I didn't do nearly as well as my expectations. I'd start out too fast. Oh yeah. I'll, I'll never forget my first ever cross country meet. You know, I, I, I was feeling pretty good about myself after all the, uh, after all the dry land training and whatnot, mm -hmm. after being basically the first one finished. Yeah, I, yeah. I thought, I, th I don't give, I thought maybe I'm a natural phenom at running. <laughs> Jeff Manley was the champ in the intermediate division and nobody was touching him. For senior boys, Ian Doyle was the guy to chase. So I'm like, okay. It was two laps of uh, Petersfield Park and I stuck with Ian for the first lap and I thought, okay, I got the second half. I, I walked almost the whole thing. Oh, so, wow. And then the rest of the cross country year didn't go so well. So after that, you know, after, you know, after not doing so well in, in the meets in high school cross country, I thought maybe running isn't for me after all. And I gave it up after that year and never picked it up again until my mid-twenties. Until your mid-twenties when yeah. you got back into it. Yeah. So tell me about that. Why did you pick it up again in your mid-twenties? I'll, I'll preface by starting out that the first half of my twenties, like many people's first half of their twenties, I spent it mostly, you know, going out on the weekends, eating really bad food. I put on the Frosh 15 and then some. AKA the college university years. J just the typical college university yeah, yeah. years for anybody. And yeah. and mine was exacerbated a bit because I realized now I was in, I was dealing with some anxiety and depression at the time. So maybe I partied a little more than typical to kind of, you know, so to, to kind of soothe those problems. Yeah. So anyway, next thing I knew, by the time I was 22 years old, 
I didn't realize it, but I was 30, 35 pounds overweight. Oh, okay. I was I was 5'10 and about 2, 225, 230. Yeah. And, you know, in my mind, I still had that athletic build from my high school days. But then Christmas 2004, we took a family picture. After I saw that family picture, I was horrified. And after almost crying a little bit, I said, oh, I'm doing something about this. I, I remembered, okay, I liked running. Mm -hmm. So cardio is the answer, lose some weight but I thought I was too big to run. I thought that I damaged the treadmill or damaged yeah, yeah. my joints. I just I just figured I'm too big a boy to run right now. Yeah. So over the spring and summer of 2005, when I was 23 years old, I walked off the weight on the, I, I walked on the treadmill. Yep. To walk. To I, start out. I, I, I spent the whole spring and summer of 05 walking on the treadmill 40 to 70 minutes a night at an incline and the first couple of weeks, there were no results at all. Right, right. But then, then the pounds started melting off. Wow. And next thing I knew, I was back to a, re you know, a reasonably trim fighting weight. I have a very similar story. I know. So, um, you know, back, and I found this later on through life, but some of the girls growing up in school used to call me Oprah because I, my weight went up and down. Oh, okay. And I didn't find that out until, like, I think it was after high school, and I was like, oh, that's kind of mean. But anyway. Let's Oprah see. ran a marathon. When you, when you run the Chicago Marathon, many people's challenge is to oh, beat, yeah. o beat Oprah. Oh, okay. So beat Oprah. I think, she ran, well, off the top, I think she ran a 420-something. Oh, okay. Which is pretty solid. For that's her. solid. Shout out to Oprah. Shout out to Oprah. <laughs> so, uh, Maybe she'll see this. Yeah, she might. Uh, I don't know. Maybe Oprah, <laughs> o Oprah at one point had the runs. <laughs> Um, so yeah, back to a uh, right quick story. I won't get too much details about why I started running, but I believe it was 2007. I was coming back from a trip from Mexico. Super excited about the trip. You know, I sent some photos home to my family and my brother, I love him, you know, but brothers make fun of each other. And he made fun of me. My weight was uh, probably about 30, 40 pounds overweight for what I typically normally About is. the same as where I was. Yeah. yeah. So then when I look back on those photos, I'm just like, oh, those are awful yeah. photos. So same thing, got a treadmill. I ran on the treadmill for about two years straight in the basement. I didn't even do any races. With the headphones in. I know it from your interview yeah, with Chantel. That's right. And, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll take the opportunity to say, now, Herbie, why the heck did you put me right after Chantel Farrell? <laughs> it's an impossible act to follow. No, no, you're, you're great. I, I, yeah. I, I know that I work in TV, so I should be able to nail this. But <laughs> Chantel, she's only been part of the running community. For less than a year. Less than a year, May of last year, Teal to Heal. She's already like Miss Congeniality of the Oh, yeah, yeah. L Laura Doucette is Barbarian of the Year, but Chantel Farrell is Miss Congeniality. Wow, that's mad props. Yeah, mad props. <laughs> like, but like, like she said, they love me. They really love me. And it's true. Everybody does Everybody yeah. does love her to oh, death. So sure. my, my point my point is she's an impossible act to follow. So damn you, well, Herbie, for doing this to me. Well, I, I don't fully agree with you on that. Congratulations on qualifying for Boston Marathon. Thank you so much. It's it's really, it, it, this sounds like a boring cliche, but it is, a, it is an adult lifelong dream come true. What does it mean to qualify for Boston? And have you been chasing down that dream for a long time? It's something I've been chasing down unconsciously for a long time. I remember, shout out to my wife, Jennifer Nolan, Jennifer McDonald, whatever yep. you want to call it, who I met through running <laughs> oh, very at, at Tuesday Track with Big Head. Nice. I was like, who's that cute? You're running next to Aaron Keeley. And, <laughs> and apparently she was thinking the same thing. So. so there you go, all you single people come out to Tuesday Night Track or Tuesday Tempo. F f funny, funny story, I'm losing my hair now, but at the time I had a huge mop of hair and apparently my hair bounced on my head as I ran. Oh, wow. So, so that was Jen's first identifier of her future husband at that Tuesday track with the Cape Breton Roadrunners was, oh, that pretty fast, pretty cute guy whose hair bounces all over the place when he runs. Now it's the guy who wears the hat. <laughs> I, I, I wear the hat for good reason. Like, hey, like myself. I had a pretty good set of hair once. I just I just think that being bald makes you look more badass at the oh, start yeah. <laughs> Scarier. Yeah, well, Walter, 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 White. Walter, White. Walter White looks scarier, yeah, Bob. exactly. I get that all the time. I think, too, I think, you know, the Salamancos took him more seriously when he buzzed his head. 100%. <laughs> so tell me about it. Yeah. What did it feel like when you qualified? Uh, I, was going, I, was, I mentioned Jennifer. I was going somewhere with that. Yeah. The, our, our first Christmas together, her gift for me was an, uh, uh, was an iPod. At the time, I listened to music when I ran. I don't anymore. Yeah. And, she, and she got it engraved in tiny letters at the bottom. Boston is waiting. And that was back in 2012, and at the oh, time, wow. and at the time, I had run a 3:21 marathon in Chicago. But at that age, I would have needed like a sub 3:05 to qualify. Okay. So for me, 
it said Boston is waiting, but for me that was years and years down the road because, like, for me at the time, the idea of running, you know, a 3-0 something for the mm -hmm. marathon, it was just unthinkable. Like, I wasn't sure if this body was physically capable of doing that. Mm -hmm. So to fast forward to the question you just asked, this year in Fredericton, I ran a 301. That was a 20-minute personal best. And, like, if you had asked me five or six years ago, you know, do you think you'll ever run a 301 in your lifetime? I would say, honestly, no. Awesome. No, thanks. That's huge. And kind of the reason why I wore this shirt today, this is one of my Boston shirts. Yeah. And you wore your Fredericton shirt. I wore my Fredericton, Fredericton Marathon 2022, and that was the race at which I qualified. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. And that was actually the race I qualified back in 2014. Okay. So enjoy Boston. It's really um, one of the best events uh, for marathon runners, and I think you're just gonna have a blast. No, thank you so much. I agree, and there, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out there are there are nine of us by my count, if I'm not mistaken. I think so. I'll have to double to check. Have to double on check. That. But like off the top of my head, there are nine of us. It's such a solid crew, and I think six out of nine are first timers. L nice. Let me see if I can do this in one take. Who are the nine? Yeah. There's myself, Timmy Fitzgerald, uh, Laura Doucette, Linda Miles, her mom, the mother daughter combo. <laughs> uh, Jason McGuigan, that's five. That's five first timers. Krista, Krista Starzomsky is the sixth and final first timer. And then our three veterans, Gary Ross, Ann Doyle, and Kate Gillis. Nice. Yeah. Ryan, I want to know what keeps you running, what keeps you motivated. Um, especially those days, you know, those days we get up. We all get, in fact, today was one of them for me. Was I, it? I was like, I'm not, I, I was in, I was in comfort mode. You know, the fireplace is on back home, you know, watched the world junior game last night and got to bed late. So I'm like, it's not, it's not the prettiest day out there. So still on holiday, still in holiday vacation mode. mode. So I was like, do I really want to get out there? And then I got out there and it was more than worth it. It's funny. You said what motivates you. I'm, I'm going to paraphrase David Goggins here. In the words of David Goggins, motivation is crap. Mot <laughs> motivation, and I know, I know Timmy Fitzgerald will love yeah. that. Cause I call I call Timmy Fitzgerald the Cape Breton Goggins because the guy is just such an animal. But and he's new. He, well, he, I shouldn't say he's he's not new to running. He's been running for a long time. He ran track as a kid, but he's newer to marathon running and bigger distances. Yeah, newer and he's to do really really breaking ground. So. He's going to be a fun guy to watch at Boston. Yeah, he's a oh, guy to watch in 2023 for sure, mind you. The things he did in 2022 were That's unbelievable. It. But but as, as Goggins and Timmy would agree, motivation is crap. Motivation comes and goes. It's got to come from somewhere deeper. And for me, mm -hmm. it's just... For me, I just I just don't feel complete without running. For me, running completes the puzzle that is this guy. And some who know me would agree that I'm um, damn it, I'm a puzzle. I'm a walking contradiction. <laughs> I'm, I'm, a, I'm a difficult thought guy to figure out. But I feel like I've I feel like the puzzle is complete, and I figure myself out after a run. Right. I mean, I will. I, I didn't want to film this until after I did my run today. It's hard to explain in words something that you just feel. Mm -hmm. would, you know, which is why, you know, you see all the, you see all the pro athletes on TV use cliches like, I've got no words, and I, mm -hmm. I kind of see what they mean. You know, it's, it's hard to explain in words something that you just viscerally feel, but there's nothing in my life that has made me feel viscerally what running does, and to an extent it feels kind of... It feels kind of like something I was meant to do here on this earth. Right. Awesome. Not not, not to say that I'm incredible, you know, somebody who says that, <laughs> it makes it sound like, you know, some sort of... So, some sort of mission that you know the man upstairs. Said, <laughs> I don't mean. I don't mean that. I just. I, I just think it was. So, I think it was meant to be part of my journey. Oh, for sport. sure. Yeah. And I and I'm. I feel the same way. But I also feel like running's for anybody. Like anybody, get a pair of shoes, go out there. You don't even have to run. Start by walking, like you did. Walking I, on I the treadmill. I walked on the treadmill. Like honest, it's it's one of those things. You can go out. You can do it. Um, let's talk races. So you've done some big races. You've done Chicago. You're going to be doing Boston. We all know that's going to be your new favorite race. But I want to know local races, and I want to know what's your favorite local race here. It's got friends. it's got to be the Cap Trail Relay Race. Nice. And, and r anybody in the running community who knows me reasonably well knows I'm a bit of a Cabot junkie, a bit of a Cabot aficionado, a bit of a Cabot geek, and. I have to, it was Alan McKenzie, who was mm -hmm. a local legend in the Cape Breton running 100%. community. And Shout out to Alan. If there's one person in the local running community who played a central role in my becoming the runner I am today, it's Alan McKenzie. Oh, probably for myself too. He, yeah. uh, we actually used to work out at CBU together and Alan and I used to run religiously at lunchtime and he was, 
he's such a great running partner to have. And now he has a new running partner, his uh, son Archie. I see him going by the house pretty much every day with the stroller. And it's awesome. <laughs> yeah, for, for, for a relatively young guy, mm -hmm. Alan, like myself, just recently turned 40, for a relatively young guy, the amount of experience and wisdom he has is unbelievable. You mm -hmm. know, you almost feel like you're talking to a veteran, you know, 20 years older than him or a... But the amount of races and you know between running and Ironman triathlons and the experience he has and, and his willingness to impart it. He's a schedule guy. <laughs> He's a numbers guy, just like you. And we're going to touch on that later on. When I was doing cross country in high school, Al Alan and I graduated the same year. So he, he and I were buddies in the cross country team. And we were kind of athletic rivals. And in my early 20s, when I was getting fat and having bad habits and whatever and running was the farthest thing from my <laughs> radar at that time he was becoming Cape Breton's top marathoner. He won, he won the Fiddler's Marathon right, in 2009. Right. So, you know, we, he and I were going on polar opposite paths at the time. Yep. And it was in my mid-twenties, I started picking up just jogging again, just once or twice a week to stay in shape. Uh, and Alan said to me, and he said, Ryan, you realize you're not bad. Don't sell yourself short. Like, you realize that, you know, you think you're just jogging around the block. You realize that you're running eight-minute miles here and you're cranking out you know, eight to 10 K in a go, you realize that if you went in a local race, you'd surprise yourself by how well you did. But I thought, I didn't think I was good enough to enter yeah. a local, so I didn't. And that, but at his, at his urging, I finally entered the Blue Nose 10 K in Halifax in okay. 2009. Yep. And over 2,000 people ran that 10K that day. Yeah. I, ran, I ran a 46.50 and, and, and finished in the top 10% of finishers. Like nice. And then, then Alan said, okay, you can do a half marathon. You could, do a half, you could wake up tomorrow morning and do a half marathon. So I trained for the Fredericton half in 2010. That was my first half marathon. And I ran it in 143.55. And from then on, I was hooked. It was, nice. if, if there was one moment from, you know, everybody, I think Chantel talked about it in her episode. Yeah, the teal for heel moment. The, the, the teal, okay. yeah. yeah, and from, from, from teal to heel on, Chantel was all in, part of the running. For me, it was the Fredericton 2010. Nice. And after I finished that race in a pretty respectable time of 143 and enjoyed every step of it, yep. oh man, I was hooked from that oh, yeah. yeah. And on the drive home, John McKinnon, one of the wisest men in local running, <laughs> he, he was, he was, he, he just, he drove the seven hours home after running a marathon that day. Oh, yeah. You know, an animal. No, and no big deal. Yeah. But he turns around to me from the driver's seat and said, Ryan, you did pretty good in the half. No reason, no reason you can't, can't do, do the, the can't do the Fiddler's Full in the fall. Nice. So I did the Fiddler's Full that fall. Oh, right and, I fin I, and I ran it in no Garmin, no yeah. watch. Yeah. No, no training plan. The only way I knew I was getting my distance in on long runs yeah. was by driving the route in my car. Oh wow! The car odometer. Yeah, I, I remember doing that too when I started out running. It's like I didn't have the Garmin watch. I needed to run say 20k. Drive it in your car. I, I did that. Go out 10k and back, and then go. Okay, I got to run here. Dri yeah, drive, drive 10k out Celtic Drive. Drop a water bottle yeah. in the ditch somewhere. Yeah. Drive 10k. Okay, I've got that's a 20k. I finished, uh, it all led to a 3.44 for my first marathon at Fiddler's, which wasn't bad for a, a complete newbie. Yeah. So buying a GPS watch or a Garmin or something really saves you money on gas. I got a GPS, I got a Garmin for Christmas that year. And, yeah. yeah, awesome. What does food look like for Ryan McDonald? How do you eat? What do you eat? What do you like to carb load on? I'm about 80% of the way to being like a vegetarian slash vegan now. Okay. I, I don't know if I'll ever go... I don't know if I'll ever go fully vegan just because, you know, uh, logistically, or at least Chantelle in her episode would disagree. She said it's not too hard. Logistically, it sounds difficult to yeah, me. Yeah, same here. I could see myself going full on vegetarian. Yeah. A few years ago, as recently as 2019, I was running a lot and I was putting up pretty good times, but my weight was not budging. I was I was 195 pounds no matter how much I ran, no yeah. matter how fast I ran, I wasn't budging and I was wondering why. And I think in retrospect, it was my diet. Not that my diet was terrible. It's right, not like right. I was scarfing McDonald's every night, but my diet was, you know, just the typical North American diet. Right. Lots, lots of meat, lots of dairy, lots, way too much white bread and, yeah. and, 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 you know, compl and not good carbs. Well, and when you're training too, like mentally, you think I need to eat more because I'm running so much. Or you're eating so much. I, that's how I feel. I don't know. Maybe it's the same for you. And, and well, at the time I kind of justified it as, you know, I'm running so much, I can within reason eat whatever I want. Yeah. And it is nice to have, I mean, after a long run, there's nothing better than that feeling than knowing you can scarf a huge brunch at Governor's and, yeah. and have no guilt about it. But 
you know, I, I was wondering why am I doing all this running and why is my weight not moving? And, and I realized, you know, my diet is too, it's too Western. It's too North American. I got to change it up a bit. So I went, I, I went kind of more foods closer to the source. Yeah. Mostly, but not completely eliminating meat. Mostly, but not completely eliminating dairy. I do like almond milk instead of milk with cereal. Um, you know, I, I'd, I, I do a veggie burger instead of a burger and, you know, so I, I almost never order fries anymore or anything deep fried. Yeah. And so, some would argue I'm a little too picky. Like, you know, we go to governors and I'm the one person with the, with the pickiest <laughs> order, but, but it's worked for me. I've dropped 20 pounds. That's great. I've dropped 20 pounds since 2019 and it's really made a difference in my running. I mean, it, it only stands to reason if you're carrying around less weight, then yeah. you're going to run faster. I've been eating so good lately. My wife's the executive director of the food hub. So oh, we get right. all our food locally sourced from mm -hmm. farmers and producers here in Cape Breton. So shout out to the food hub. And, uh, you know, you just order online, comes in every week. And, you know, it's, it's so different eating meat that comes locally from a farm here oh, no doubt. than getting something from the big box stores, right? So I don't know. I think it's doing wonders for my running. Yeah. And, and shout out to my wife, Jennifer, because she she does 99% <laughs> of the cooking in our house. And, you know, yeah. the vast majority of the time, like she's willing to cook, you know, plant-based, vegetarian, vegan meals, you know, yeah. health, healthy, you know, quinoa-based salads, soups. Oh, I'm getting hungry now. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Jen kind of has similar eating thoughts to me, you know. Mm -hmm. we're, we're both about 80% of the way vegetarian, and, yeah. and, and she's willing to cook the kind of healthy meals that I need to run well and train well, so I'm, I'm really lucky to have her. You know? Yeah, yeah. And I'm kind of the same. My wife, Maura, does the majority of the cooking, thank God. I, um, when it's my time to cook, I usually do pizza or uh, barbecue. <laughs> oh, exactly. Tell me about a run that you, it could be a race or a run, doesn't matter, but something you really had a hard time getting through and what got you through it? The worst run of my life was definitely Leg 5 Cabot Trail Relay 2016. I tried to chase Lockie McKinnon at the start. Oh yeah. And, and that wasn't wise. And I, I, but, but I don't really have a story as to what got me through. Nothing got me through that except for the need to cross the finish line. Yeah, yeah. Um, Lockie McKinnon, that's a, a great runner. Uh, originally from Sydney Mines, I want to say. I think, I think you're yeah. right. And, I, and, and Lockie, in, in my, especially in my early years, after I ran that first half in Fredericton in 2010, yep. and my first full at Fiddlers in 2010, and I was hooked, Lockie really took me under his wing. Nice. Lockie and Team Coxeeth really, yeah. took, really took me under their wing the next few years, and I ran all my weekend long runs with them. And, you know, the amount of experience I had to tap, we had Lockie, Terry Morris, the workhorse. The workhorse, yeah. Fl Great Fl runner. Yeah, Florence Gillis, Flo Jo, yeah. uh, Joey Tepper was running with us, Donnie yeah. McIntyre, Jesus. Donnie Mac, P yeah. Possibly the toughest ombre that we Man. That I've met in the Cape Breton room. Just a fast guy. He, sure. he doesn't. He's not running these days, but oh my God, oh. what an animal! He'll he'll be back. Oh, hopefully. I love running into Lockie. Like literally, I'll be out running and I run into Lockie yeah. and we stop and talk because I just pick his brain for information. He's got a lot of good information up there for, for running. For whatever reason, even when I was a total rookie newbie back, mm -hmm. for whatever reason, Lockie always had a lot of time for me. And I always wondered why, because he, he also doesn't strike me as a guy who impresses easily. He doesn't strike me as a guy who wastes his time on people. Yeah, who, yeah exactly. And so I'm thinking, I'm thinking, oh my God, you know, I thought it would be harder to earn his favor. Yet he always, he always seemed to have time for me. I always seemed to have a soft spot for yeah. me. And maybe that was an early sign that I was on to something good. But yeah. I, I think he was able to see early on that I truly did love it from, from the bottom of my heart. And you do. You oh, love I, it. I love it so and, much. And I, this is a question um, I couldn't wait to talk to you about, but you love it so much that you are on Strava. You are a numbers guy. You know the numbers mm -hmm. of other... You could probably tell me my my best, personal best for my, you know, like my 5K, my half marathons, full marathons, before I could your, even Boy, your personal best marathon was Barrington Passage 2021. <laughs> 247, really a 246 if you account for the fact the course was two or 300 meters too long. Yeah, that's okay though. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll scratch that. Yeah. But yeah, exactly. And you know, not just me, but you know a lot of the local runners. Who are some of your favorite local runners? My new local running hero is becoming Timmy Fitzgerald. Yeah. And just because, you know, just because he, he, pro he approaches it with that raw animalistic fervor that... I have to tell this, Timmy. 
So Timmy and I, we've known each other for a few years now, and he came to me and he said, oh, I need a uh, training schedule. So I said, here, Timmy, here's the one I always use. I've been using it since 2014, 2015. I said, every time I use it and follow it 16 weeks, I get faster and faster. Give that a go. So he did, and that's the one training schedule he used for his first marathon, which was uh, the Blue Nose. He came second place with a 246. And I said to him, Timmy, why did you do Blue Nose as your first marathon? I said, it's a little challenging. It's a bit of a hilly course. I've done the Blue Nose full of myself. Blue Nose almost seems to, I don't mean, I don't mean to throw shade here, but it almost seems to go out of its way to choose the hilliest course possible. Yeah. It is not a PB course. So, no. so Timmy looked at me and he said, oh, I like a, a good challenge <laughs> and I, I want my first one to be a challenge. And that's why I did it. Fast forward to the Big Breton Ultra backyard. Uh, Timmy and I ran our loops together for the majority. And I went up to, I ran 10 loops, and then I was at the starting line, and I looked at Timmy and I said, I'm not going to go anymore. And you guys go ahead. It was him and Doug Leone left. And he was like, no, come on. Like, he was so disappointed. And then he went, and I think uh, him and Doug did another loop, and then he went off to do his next loop with Doug, and that's when Doug bowed down and said, no, you got this, Timmy, go ahead. And Timmy was like, Doug said he was almost like heartbroken. And he wanted to keep going all night. So I'm excited to see what he's going to do at the next one. Six days after running that 246 marathon That's at Blue Nose, right. he went out at the Cabot Trail Relay and ran leg six, which is also a hilly, tough leg. That is a tough leg. And he ran it in like 341 a kilometer. He came, yeah. he came fifth overall. He was right behind Dan Way of the Black Lungs, who was like a running legend. And yeah, exactly. Like the, like the fact that Timmy was able to throw down a run like that six days after the Blue Nose Marathon. I mean, typically six days after a marathon, you're supposed to still have your feet up on, on the couch in some slippers or covering. <laughs> just, just crazy. And it's, yeah. it's almost, it's, it's pretty exciting to think of what he, he'll be capable of this year. Yeah, he's the guy to watch for sure. Krista Storzomsky is becoming a favorite. It, it, her story is incredible because we might see Krista and on this show. It would be it, it would be remiss if we didn't. But yeah. yeah, her story is kind of incredible because she can correct me if I'm wrong, but mm -hmm. long story short, I think she basically just picked up. I think she had a background in some other athletics and picked up running during the pandemic in yeah. 2020 because gyms were closed. Next thing you know, she's joined the Halifax Road Hammers, uh, my advice, and, yeah. and next thing you know, she's qualified for Boston in her first marathon, and, is, and now she's leveled up and is cranking out some unbelievable runs. She's somebody whose results are, they're not going to surprise me, but they're going to surprise a lot of people in, 20, yeah, oh, in, in 2023. Sure. I discovered her at some of the local races, and I knew right away that she was someone to watch, <laughs> and I, uh, I asked her actually to be a part of our mixed Cabot Trail running team last year where we actually took home first place. Oh, yeah. And she and she was a perfect fit in so many ways. Perfect, yeah. yeah. Not just in terms of how she ran and executed and planned for her leg, but in terms of suppo support. support and kind of like Sarah Penny. She, she was our glue gal on that team. I know, and she's not on my team this year, so Sarah, I'm coming after you. Cape Breton Roadrunners, I can say from 11 or 12 years of experience being part of the group, it's so inclusive and so friendly. Like, if you're relatively new to the sport and you're maybe hesitant about doing it with other people, like, you know, Watch Chantel's episode as proof positive that, you know, you can be brand new to the sport. You can be, or, or I'm not saying Chantel is, but, but, but somebody else can be new to the sport and be at the back of the pack. And like still the people at the front of the pack, the Timmy Fitzgeralds, the Laura Doucettes, the Justin Lalons, the elite runners around here are just as welcoming and encouraging. And it's not like oh, 100%. In, in, in some other sports, let's be honest, in some other sports, you know, the top athletes might act a little snooty, a little too good for the beginners, the newbies. Yeah, yeah. And from my experience, that is true in some other sports. It's not true in running. Like the, the like the top athletes are as humble and approachable as anybody else. And yeah. honest, honestly, with Cape Breton Roadrunners, people don't people really don't care how quick you are, how slow you are. They just want to see you come out, have a good time. And uh, be a part of the running community for sure. Yeah, but but that said, it's it's not like you know, it's it's not like one of those everybody. It, it's not like one of those everybody gets an equal participation medal. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, exactly. Uh, it, that that sounds soft to me. Like yeah, I, yeah. I like there to be some incentive. And yeah, there's definitely competition. Yeah. Um, and you know, we all run because we're all trying to beat our own times. We're running against each other, really. Mm. But at the same time, we go to the races and we kind of know where we're going to be in the pack. We kind of expect. 
a certain level, I guess you could say. And, and, to, and to me, that's uh, like you touched on earlier, to me, one of the things I enjoy most, I enjoy, as much as I enjoy my own running, I lo I just love seeing how everybody else is coming along. And yeah. and, and that's equally true for people who are, you know, who are who are the, among the fastest and among the new, I, I just love seeing, I, I just love following every local runner's personal journey and how they progress and, yeah, totally. you know, to the point where I can kind of peg where they're gonna finish in all the races. To me, it's just, Fascinating watching each person's evolution and each person's own little go with this. Well, that's it. It's everybody has their own running story to tell, and I and think that's why we're here doing it. That. <laughs> I think that's I think that's why this podcast yeah. was created. Exactly. Yeah. Some quick questions for you. Any injuries? Knock on wood. Pretty good. Uh, I was I was not blessed with a typical runner's body. You know, you, pe you people think of a runner as you know really skinny. You know. Yeah. Uh, as oh my god my my first marathon at fiddlers in 2010 yeah gary lewis ran a few miles with me near the start of the race G gary lewis friggin legend that guy is brett and tire go check him out <laughs> actually i just got new tires from gary down at brett and tires awesome dude go check him out and, and gary's a guy who shoots from the hip and just says whatever so he's running he's running next to me he says ryan I admire you a lot more than the other uh, than some of the other runners out here, and I'm like, why? He said, because you're not built like a runner. He said, he said, he said, you're built like an NFL linebacker. He said, look at the shoulders on you, yeah, yeah. you know, and like how much weight you're carrying in that upper. He wasn't calling me fat or run no, or, no, or yeah. not fit, but he was just saying, I'm I'm built like a hockey defenseman or or a, or a football linebacker. So so my point is. I don't have that natural ectomorphic skinner, skinny runner's build, yeah. but knock on wood, I, 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 knock on wood, I'm pretty, I'm pretty durable. I've had a nice. few, if I've had hardly any injuries. Yeah. And it's funny you talk about not having that runner's build. I don't think I have that natural running build either. You're pretty, you're pretty tiny now, but, yeah. it, but it didn't come naturally. It didn't come naturally. And I think back, I think to when you go to the races and you start going to the races for the first time, you see people and they got the... The really expensive running shoes and the running clothes on. Don't they, be fooled by and that. And they look like they're fast. And then the race starts, and, and you, you realize, and you smoke them, and you smoke them, <laughs> and you realize, oh, they're just, you know, they maybe they love running just as much as we all do. But it just goes to show you, you can look like a, the best runner in the world, and you may not be the best runner in the world. That's a good. That's a good piece of advice for newbies. Don't look around the start line and get intimidated because. If I had a nickel for every time I lined up at the start yeah. against some guy or girl, especially a guy who looked like they jumped off the cover of Runner's World magazine, you know, they got the perfect runner's physique. They, you know, they look like they're gonna, they look like they're gonna blow the doors off and win the thing. And I'm just looking <laughs> at them thinking, oh my. And eight times out of ten, I end up beating that person. So, you know, so don't funny, be intimidated. And it's funny you say that too. I think of the big races, so like the big marathons, like Toronto and Chicago, New York and um, Boston, a lot of times people are like, oh, I'm not fast enough to get into Boston. No, that might not happen, but you can get in other ways. You can get in through lottery and char charity and that kind of stuff. But I think everybody should go and do a big marathon somewhere. You know, you can just go to Toronto and do a really big one where you're lined up with thousands and thousands of people and so much fun. Um, there's some really big marathons here, of course, the Fiddlers, the Fredericton, the... Um, the blue nose, those are big. But if you can have the opportunity to go travel to one that has like between twenty and thirty thousand people, and you're in there, it's so so fun. And I've only done that once. I did Chicago back in 2012, but I'm gonna do Boston this April. Mm -hmm. So that'll be two of the six world marathon majors down. So contrary to Chantel Farrell, who wants to do every marathon but the six majors. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I, would, and I wouldn't bet against her. I imagine that at the end of the day, she's going to have an amazing list of races she'll have done. Oh, for sure. But I, I think I, I think if I'll have two out of the six done, I may as well do the six marathon majors. So. Speaking of which, a couple of members of the local running community, Donna Burns, Kathy Sparling, mm -hmm. uh, they have four out of the six marathon made. All they have left is London and Tokyo. And, and Tokyo. So they're going to do London yeah. in the spring and then... Uh, We'll see when they do Tokyo. And, and again, two more people who are so generous with their with their experience, their time. They'll take anybody under their wing, and I'll, I'll take this opportunity to. Yeah, go ahead. This is <laughs> this 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 is the peeps. The running peeps is a, is our Saturday morning. <laughs> God love. They're so they're so kind. They they threw a party for my fortieth birthday back in March. 
And as part of a gift, it was it was a gift for the whole group. They they swagged oh, us awesome. they, they swagged us all out in these hats. Shout out to Amy Crow, who uh, who I think pulled the trigger on these. I like to say I bring down the average age of that group. Because, You're the young buck. <laughs> it makes it makes me feel young because everybody else in the group is in their fifties and sixties, and, oh, okay. and they're all experienced. You know, half of, most of them have done the Boston's, have done yeah. the Chicago's, have done the New York cities. They're so experienced, and and experienced is another way of calling you guys old. <laughs> But so shout out to the running piece. Shout out to them, yes. And I know them well. I used to run with them quite a bit back in the day. Um, some of my favorite runners that taught me more about running than anything would be um, uh, Tanya Brand Yes, for and sure. And Kim Scatalone. I remember so much what they told me when I started out running. Um, Kim would always tell me, like, drink, take, take some water. At least every 3K, every mile, have a drink of water. Even if you're not thirsty, have a drink of water. Tanya was fantastic, she always said, no matter what, always keep running, no matter how busy things get, get out there and run, because at the end of the day, you'll enjoy it. So, you know, you meet so many people in the running community throughout the years, and just like uh, any kind of friend, you know, friends come and go, running buddies come and go, but you always meet up down the line, and uh, it's like you never, you, you always kind of keep where you left off and you never forget your running buddies those those friendships for forged on the road are strong ones because when you when you when you grind through those long distances together when you suffer through those speed intervals together that creates a bond that's kind of unspoken but it's it's so understood. I I I've, I said this. I said this long ago after battling Judy Burfato. Shout out to Judy. Judy. Little, <laughs> I, I said this long ago after after when I was new to the game, battling Judy Judy Burfato in a local five miler. I said when you race the last couple of k of a race against somebody and you're and you're battling tooth and nail to the death with them, and you and you're both just gasping for air and hurting and suffering. It it, it gives you that much more of an appreciation for an understanding of that person and, and, exactly. and, and you you know your respect for that person just goes up tenfold and, and, and the, the, those kinds of the, those kinds of experiences forged on the road you know mm -hmm. they run deep yeah why don't you tell us about the time that you and Tanya drank out of my hose on a hot day oh jeez <laughs> that just happens around here man like it's Cape Breton everybody knows everybody so uh, we were out and it was mm -hmm. just out running, training run, and it was just a super... It was like a 28, 30 degree summer day. Yeah, very hot. We were running by <laughs> Ryan's house. Which, we, which is near the Bellard Trails. Yeah, and we knew Ryan, of course, and he wasn't home. <laughs> so I said, well, let's just go and uh, drink from his hose. So we turned the hose on and had a little drink to cool down. And yeah, I've done that a few times. Actually, I did it at Justin Lalonde's house once. <laughs> and uh, I didn't let it run long enough, so it came out right away. I started drinking. It was like rusty water. <laughs> it was gross. I wasn't home at the time, but... <laughs> but Jen, my wife, she said she popped her head out the door and there's just Herbie, there's Herbie and Tanya just drinking straight out of our faucet on the side of our house. Was, oh, it you or, was, it, was it you or Tanya who afterwards said to me, best water in the CBRM? <laughs> Probably Tanya. <laughs> yeah, anything, anything would have tasted amazing yeah. after that hot day. Tell me, what advice do you, Ryan McDonald, have for new runners? Advice for new runners, like like I said, don't be intimidated by you know the more experienced people, the faster people, because I can from my own experience I can tell before you know it you're one of them, before you know it you're their equal, and and they're and they're as welcoming and as friendly as as the others at the back of the pack, and I I guess another another piece of advice for new runners this sounds like a cliche but like make it about the process more than about the result like. The finishing time at that mm -hmm. marathon, the finishing time of that race, like if you're focused too much on that, you could set yourself up for disappointment because mm -hmm. like race day could be fickle and flimsy. You can you can have a perfect training block and then have 30 degree heat or you know gale force wind and rain in the face on race day. You never know what's going to happen. It's got to be about the process more than about the result. You have yeah. to, like I, I'm starting my training for Boston now and like to, to me, I plan on enjoying, when I trained for Fredericton last year, which mm -hmm. was where I qualified for Boston, I enjoyed all the miles I logged through, through the winter more than I loved crossing the finish line in a Boston qualifying time. Yeah. It, make, it, make it more about the process than about the result, and the results will take care of themselves. I have uh, people come to me all the time, and they're like, they know I'm, I love running, I'm, they see me out there all the time. And they always say, oh, you know, I love running. I start and I stop. And, and do you have any advice for me? And I always say it's always, always, always about consistency. Um, I see people do it all the time where 
you know, they want to come to the Cabot Trail Relay, so they come to the Cabot Trail re Relay and they run. But that's the only time you see them. Hmm. You have to run all the time. You have to run throughout the year, even in the cold oh. months. And I'm not trying to say that to, to sound like a jerk or anything, but it is consistency. You can't run for two weeks and then stop and pick it up again another two or three weeks down the road. You're going to do damage to yourself by doing that. You have to run all the time. And I'm not talking every day. No. You know, take days off are important. Recovery days are important. If, if you're somebody who wants to run every day, that's then fine. just... But... just bring your mileage down a bit, but you have to run throughout the year. You just can't make it a seasonal sport. Oh, hundred percent. And, and I've always been an all seasons. Even when I was, even when I was brand new, I was yeah. always an all seasons guy. And to be honest, may, maybe I'm, maybe I'm a bit masochistic too, but to be honest, winter running is some of my favorite running. Same here. Yeah. I, I actually, well, personally, I hate the heat. So yeah, I, I like yeah. running in the winter. Oh, I, yeah. And to, and to me that crisp air refreshing into the lungs and, you know, mm -hmm. half the battle in running is not to overheat, is not to overheat your body especially if you're somebody like me or like a Chris Milburn to talk about a guy who's done you know yeoman's work for the running community but people like us we're, we're warm-blooded animals yeah. we, we overheat easily so to me I you know th that th those temperatures between minus two and plus two that that's my wheelhouse that, that's where I can do some damage it's always knowing um, what to wear because I, I, see people, I see people when they show up to a race or they show up to a, a tempo run and I see what they're wearing and I tell them, you're going to want to take those mitts off five minutes into this yeah. run. You're going to want to throw your jacket into the woods and pick it up later. And look at the JJ. The Long John, <laughs> the Long John half marathon happens at the usually the end of February. And there's more running gear on the side of the road <laughs> on that race than any other oh, race. Oh, it looks like Value Village. It's crazy. <laughs> One thing I pride myself on is I like to nail the dress code. You have to... Yeah. And, and it's not something I do in my personal life. In my personal life, I just grab whatever the hell's on the, on the hanger and wear it. But for running... I think Alan McKenzie told me this one yep. is a, a good a good rule of thumb to go by is dress like it's 10 degrees warmer. I'm a guy who played a lot of sports growing up, not necessarily good at them, but played a lot of sports growing up. And compared to the other sports, this community is just so more so much more inclusive. I mean, you feel like you belong yeah. right away. Like so, like some people, uh, not necessarily me, but some people will feel a little self-conscious, you know, going to trying a new thing or or putting themselves out there publicly doing it for the first mm -hmm. time and like everybody everybody's so welcoming and I think it's kind of part and parcel of what of what running people are like. Ru running people and the local running community are also the most trustworthy people you can find. P people laugh at me because yeah, yeah. I'll show up to races and I'll just fire my car keys anywhere. I'll fire my wallet anywhere and people will be like, my wife knows that best. <laughs> oh yeah. I think she's held on to your keys and wallet a few times. But, but, and people ask me, Ryan, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm among runners. Nobody's going to touch my stuff. I'm just going to talk about your work for a second. You're, oh, sure. you're a news anchor for uh, CTV no, Atlantic no, no. News. News reporter. Re re reporter. Yeah, videographer. Videographer whatever, whatever you slash say. reporter yeah. for CTV News. What do your co-workers think of your running? And they must be excited that you qualified for Boston. Yeah, they really are. I, I couldn't get over how I couldn't get over how excited my co-workers were were for me to qualify for Boston. I think I think the plan is to allow me to a little bit of airtime with a couple of stories uh, this coming winter and spring to kind of, you know, share my journey to Boston kind of mm -hmm. like I'm doing now in this podcast and Yes, some of my workers who don't run don't get it. My coworker Kyle Moore, the way he puts oh, it, yeah. if he can't get a hold of me, he'll say, "Oh, you must be out running laps," <laughs> as if all I do is run laps on a hamster wheel. Yeah. <laughs> but, but some of them don't get it, but they know it's part of what makes me me. And, and like like you just said, the running and the TV broadcasting—they're really twin passions of mine. Yep. And I and I love opportunities where I get to combine those passions. And really, whenever I get a chance, I like to to do a story on a local runner or yeah. profile them, whether it's Timmy Fitzgerald, the running mailman, yeah. whether it's Linda and Laura Miles, mom and daughters running the Boston Marathon together, John and Kara McKinnon running the Boston Marathon yeah. together, or um, there's so many other examples. Yeah. That to me, that's how I give back. I'm not you. You you give back by or organizing literally <laughs> uh, everything. I don't do that, so I give I, I give back by doing stories. Well, that's on, a great way to do it. And, 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 and people I, love seeing yeah, them too. So yeah, it's great. And, and and it 
And to me, it's to me, it's a chance to give certain people, certain runners, certain people in the local community their due. You know, mm -hmm. like some people don't realize, my God, I'm a damn interesting story. Some people don't realize, you know, what I'm doing is something other people would find inspiring or interesting. Mm -hmm. So, so to be able to shine a light on that, it's taking my two passions and combining them, and it's a huge privilege. Awesome. Yeah. Brian, cheers. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Here it is. Cheers, buddy. Cheers. Thanks, Thanks for coming on the show. There's one thing left to do, and you gotta look at the camera and say the line, buddy. I'm Ryan McDonald, and as of this episode, I've got the runs. <laughs> <laughs>